Hi, everybody. This is Wynn Claybaugh here at Dina Palmitchell Schools, and I'm, I'm watching the, the participants uh, grow as we let people into this wonderful podcast. Um, you're seeing on the screen this beautiful woman, Patrice Washington. And, um, you know, everything happens for a reason. Patrice, you and I scheduled this a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> had we not scheduled it a long time ago, I would have been on the phone with you at midnight last night saying, Patrice, are you available today? So I'm so, so grateful that, that we do have this scheduled. I'm, I'm grateful for everybody who's been communicating back and forth. Um, there is a lot to talk about today. Yeah. And this message will be recorded and shared through all of our platforms. Um, in the Palmetto School world, we are not at all um, about editing the messages that, that need to get out there. And for those of you who are brand new to who Patrice Washington is, she's been a very good friend and supporter of our Palmetto Schools for several years now. Uh, I came across Patrice through our very dear friend, Tim Story who sent me, I said, Tim, I need, a, I need a brilliant speaker on this topic. And he said, here, Wynn, here are three that I think would be great. And my, my heart, my, my attention went to one person, don't know why, except for everything happens for a reason, but my heart went to you. And I, I blessed that day that for whatever reason, I was drawn to you, uh, to your beauty, to your message. And um, sight unseen, basically, I put you on the most important stage that I have, and that is in front of our provincial school leaders, and you delivered, and then we need you again and again and again. And so thank you so much for that history that you have shared with us, Patrice. Uh, welcome to this wonderful podcast for our provincial school future professionals and, and leaders. Oh, I'm always honored to be amongst my Paul Mitchell family. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you I have met as I've gone to the schools all across the country, but it's always a good time. It's always love. And mm -hmm. uh, you're so right, when This couldn't have been timed any better. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been timed better. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, you guys. I'm going to be emotional through this, but you know, you all know me and that's okay. So Patrice, you put out a, a, a video message. It was a, I think it was 10 minutes long uh, well, that you posted, 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I've watched it a couple of times uh, this morning and um, it was profound for me because with what is happening in this country right now, even as we speak, what's been happening for the last week since the, since the murder of uh, George Floyd and um, the unrest we, we need leaders and we need heroes to speak their minds. And in that video, you said that the past week was one of the hardest of your life. And I know some of the things that you've been through. So for you to make that statement, I mean, I listened. Uh, you said it was just a huge heartbreak. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, you do know me when, so for those who don't know, my whole claim to fame is about my story of building a seven figure business straight out of college, losing it all in the recession, being at the point of scraping up change and getting on welfare and food stamps and all the things to rebuilding my life to become America's money maven. And so I've been through a lot of things. I've been through my first child dying in my arms after five hours. Um, I've been through having to lay people off. I mean, I, you know, all kinds of things that really shake you and, and rattle you a bit. Um, but this past week, I've just been devastated and heartbroken. Um, one at the death of an unarmed black man, again. Um, and then two, at the response or non-response of many people, but in particular for me, this was one of the first times that it dawned on me um, that people that I love, people that I know I have really great relationships with, did not, do not see me as the same as people who die in the street or die because they were jogging 
and someone assumes something or die and for any number of reasons because they're chewing gum wrong or peddling cigarettes outside of a store or had a forged a check or any of these things that might not be great things or they're normal things that other people get to do without question that right. a lot of people look like me don't get to do and the thing is um, for me when I have a different privilege right so I'm very clear that even as a black woman there's still privilege that I have in this country and I think, and, and that privilege would be educated. Um, it would be being rich by, you know, definition. I would be considered a rich woman. It would be because I consider myself a Christian in this country. That's a privilege that you can say that, right? There's a lot of things that still make me privileged. And the video that I posted was because I just really needed people who love me, befriend me, follow me, are fans of me, however you experience me to understand that there's no difference between me and George Floyd. There's no difference between my nephew and Ahmaud Arbery. There's no difference between my husband and any of the men who have died um, senselessly. And I just posted the video because it was breaking my heart that people that I'm very close with didn't see the difference. Um, yeah. I hope you don't mind if I ask you to uh, repeat the story of going on an elevator because that was mm -hmm. profound. That was, I took so much just from that story, let alone the morals that you shared after that story. And I've, I've, I've taken notes and I'm taking notes even as you speak. So everybody, if you see me look down, that's, that's what I'm doing to keep us uh, on target here. So uh, yeah. You were invited by the Dr. Oz show. Yeah. Ago to I was invited by the Dr. Oz show uh, for the first time. And I was so excited, you guys. I would travel from Los Angeles to New York, first class, black car service, a suite in the Waldorf Astoria. And again, if you know my story and you know where I come from, South Central Los Angeles, you know, Lamert Park area you know, to have this experience after growing up watching Dr. Oz, a lot of my 20s, you know, getting this invite, it, it was amazing. I was, you know, floating, like floating, like this is gonna be epic. And that morning I wake up and I break my nail. And so you guys know how uh, critical that is. <laughs> I broke my nail and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go get my nails done really quickly um, before they come to pick me up to take me to the show. And so it was a rainy day in New York City. I was high, I was high up on the 20-something floor. I was the first person on the elevator. As I'm going down, a white couple gets on the elevator. They're in their late 20s, maybe early 30s. And I greet them. I say good morning, because that's what I do. And we have a friendly exchange back and forth. We snicker. I don't even remember about what, but it was a nice exchange, right? Uh, we continue to go down some floors. A white gentleman gets on the elevator, he's about mid forties or so. I say good morning to him. He says, good morning. No big, you know, we, we go on. We get down some more floors and an older white couple gets on and they get on and I say, good morning. They don't say anything, which is fine. Cause I'm also used to people not responding. Black, white, doesn't matter. People, you know, it's not their thing all the time. And we get to the lobby and it's time the doors open and the older gentleman who's in the front um, holds the door and says, ladies first, and his wife gets off and the other woman next to me get off, she gets off. And as I step, as I step forward to get off, he puts his long umbrella up and he blocks me and he's, the umbrella is touching me. Like he puts the umbrella up to block me. And I, I was shocked. And he looked at me dead in my eyes and he said, I said, ladies first. And I was so shocked that I just couldn't muster up the words. I didn't have words, like I just, it happened so quickly. And I thought, I, you know, it just happened so quickly. I had a hat on, I was like, maybe he thinks I'm a, a guy. I, like I couldn't wrap my mind around it. And the thing that hurt worse than that, because I'm used to racists. I've encountered racism 
pretty much my entire adult life. I didn't notice it as a child, but as an adult. So I didn't, I, I, was, I was shocked, but I'm also, you know, I think for many people of color, we could become accustomed to foolishness. So that was ridiculous. But the real problem for me was the other white people who were on the elevator with me that smiled. They said, good morning. They had the banter back and forth. And when this man did this, when he blocked me, the other men got off the elevator. They didn't say, that's not right. They didn't say, what are you doing? They didn't, like, they didn't defend me. They didn't, they didn't say anything. One guy looked back at me like, dang, sorry, that sucks for her. And they went on about their day, but I was broken and I was going to go make a national television appearance. And I was just in, in shock. I was walking around numb, like, you know, um, going to look for a nail shop and call my mom and my husband. And, you know, I, I felt so by myself, you know, even being there um, in that moment, I just felt so by myself. And I, I think the other thing that people don't recognize when is you experience this, this type of trauma over and over again, and you're expected to push through. You're expected to keep smiling and to get on stage or, you know, get on the podcast or get on the thing and just push through like everything is, is okay. And the worst part of it is the way people deny your reality by explaining it away. Um, like, well, oh, he was just, he was just a bad person. It's like, you know, this happened to me because I'm black. Don't like, Yes, there's evil and good, but this happened to me because I'm Black. And evil, racism is a form of evil. Like, so we just need to call it what it is as opposed to just sweeping it under the rug, you know? Um, and so the reason I made the video and I just felt led to share that story, I have so many stories to be honest, but I shared that story is because I do have a lot of white friends. I do have a lot of people that I love dearly like I consider them to be my really good friends and the silence was deafening over the last week you know it was just it was too loud the silence was too loud and it was eating me up to think that to, to think that people who know me may even feel that that's okay um or that's, I, I don't even know. I still don't have complete words. You know, that video has been shared over, I don't know how many thousands times. I still don't have complete words. I just know that as a black woman with some level of a platform, I knew I had to be a voice for many people who look like me and feel like me, but can't articulate it, don't have the words to articulate it and don't have the reach that I have to make people take it a little bit seriously, more seriously. I think, I think that's, uh, one of your messages is, uh, I mean, a couple of things come up, is uh, this is happening to you. You're experiencing this, and yet you don't have the words. Yet you don't know exactly what the message is. And I'm sure a lot of people watching and listening to this right now, I feel this too. Like, what am I supposed to do? And, and one of the messages that I'm getting back is I just need to, for lack of a better term, just sh shut up and listen. I need to, I need to listen. I needed, I need to, to listen to your experience, to listen to that story. You know, I would like to think that I would have been the person on the elevator that stood up to that man, but you were in shock. So not only did this happen to you, uh, so not only are you supposed to deal with the trauma of something like that happened to you, you're also supposed to have the wherewithal to now defend yourself at the same time that somehow that falls on you as well. I remember years ago, um, uh, a friend making the comment or a person making the comment of somebody who was going through cancer and their, and their response was, well, she has so much power, you know, she could be doing more to raise money for cancer awareness. So not only is she supposed to go through the cancer herself, but now she's also supposed to stand on the platform to raise money and raise awareness for cancer. 
Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, that's been um, something, a conversation that I've been having with people in my DMs. I've, I've literally gotten you guys thousands of DMs since Friday, since that video came out. And not only is it unfair to expect people to live it and defend it, like I, I can't live it and defend it um, because already the people who behave this way, they already have made a choice not to listen to me, right? So there's no going back and forth with someone who is cemented in this belief, right? right. You have a better chance um, of getting to someone than I do because they've already made a decision about me just based on the color of my skin. Right. But in my DMs, the struggle that I'm now having is that people expect me to call them out on it and then coddle them. I can't, I can't call you out, coddle you, coach you on what to do, what to read, what podcast to listen to, and grieve, and be in disbelief of what's happened in the last several days. I can't carry all of that burden. Like, and I've literally had hundreds of people DMing me saying, well what, sh well, what do I post? Well, what do I say? Say it's not right. It's, it, you know, it's not about having some eloquent speech prepared. It's about speaking from your heart and saying, you know what, this isn't right. And I won't tolerate it because the people who feel this way, they openly say these things more in front of you than they would in front of me. Right. I get the, like the, the action of it, but the words and the, that happens more in circles where they're comfortable than it does in front of me. I so, think that's a common, sorry. I no, think that's a common reaction. Something happens and people are like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Someone should do something about that. Someone should step up. Mm -hmm. And the message that you're trying to deliver to us right now is, well, who is that someone? It's, it's, it's us. Yeah. It's, it's you. And I read one of the, somebody had posted a response to your video uh, about, well, I don't really have an audience. I don't really have uh, a platform. I don't have thousands of followers. Uh, what can I do? And, and then I read your response to them is like, well, you have children, right? That's, that's your platform. You have young kids at home. That's, can you talk about that? Well, first of all, I truly believe that an audience of one is still an audience. And every Perfect. single one of us have people in our lives that we influence. You know, you don't have to have a million Instagram followers. You don't have to have a thousand friends on Facebook. You have someone that you interact with on a daily, weekly, annual basis that actually might listen to you if you were just to put it out there. And I think the fear of what people may say or saying something wrong is what holds people back because many of the people who I've exchanged with in my DMs it's the, it's the fear of what they have to go through, the back and forth they may have to experience if they say something wrong, right? So if you say Black versus African American, you know, which is a debate for some people, or if you say this versus that, and you don't want to say the wrong thing, but I, it's better to say the wrong thing and just and to allow silent? people to correct you if that's necessary than to be okay. silent because mm -hmm. you still have the luxury of saying nothing. I don't have the luxury of taking my skin off. Right. I don't have that as a luxury. So you say you commit to saying the wrong thing until you figure out what works for you and and also be okay with the fact that you might lose some friends. You might have some tough conversations with family members. But are other human lives not worth that? Well, I think the word that you just said conversation that's what's missing there's not a conversation we avoid the conversation because oh my gosh should i say black should i say african-american what if i offend my friends who are racist or family members who don't get it what if i offend them as opposed to not speaking up on behalf of my my black friends and so i'll just avoid any conversation what do you say to those people that silence only benefits the tormentor <laughs> Right? Oh. The silence does not do anything for the tormented. Uh, you mm. know, that's a paraphrase of um, Eli Wizzles, Wizzles uh, quote, who was a Holocaust survivor. And, you know, you, you have to make a decision that you won't just be neutral. And, you know, the video was called Dear White Friend, You Have to Pick a Side. And people wanted to 
say, well, I'm not, you know, picking the side of rioters or looters when police officers died. I had made, and I made no mention of that, but that goes back to people being so committed to having their, like their opinion, right? So committed to it that they won't open up their hearts, their ears, their minds, and just listen and stop denying the reality of a entire community of people in this country. Like you just cannot keep denying that this is the reality. No, it's not media making it up. No, it's not media sensationalizing it. If you heard every story, just among my, my community, right? Like my immediate family, if we all documented all the stories from our life, we could fill up a week's worth of the news. Right. So there's for every video that we see, there's probably 10,000 that we don't. You, you mentioned the word neutral. Can you define that a little bit more? You say it's not enough to be neutral. neutral. It's well, not what, what, is, what does that look like when PR people are being neutral? What does that look like and what do they need to avoid? Yeah. Educate us. So if you're neutral, that means you consider yourself to be non-racist, right? In this, in this particular scenario, you consider yourself to be non-racist. So if you're neutral, you probably say things like, well, all lives matter. All lives matter, true. But right now we're talking about black lives, right? right? So, you know, that would be like going to a breast cancer walk and saying, colon cancer matters. Got it. It does, but right now we're at the breast cancer walk. So can we support women and men who are suffering from breast cancer without bringing up all the other types of cancer, right? right. It would be, you, you take a neutral stance when you say things like, I don't see color. You have to see color. Like, you can look at me and tell that I'm a black woman. What, it does not, it does not flatter me or anyone who looks like me for you to say, well, I don't even see your color. Well, that's crazy because I can see yours, right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging my color. I need you to see my color because I need you to see who you need to defend and who you need to protect in those moments when people come for us for no reason but our color. Hmm. You don't see color, but the people harassing us see color. And so if you're going to be an ally, you got to see my color and you have to stand with me and sometimes use your color to help me to protect me, to defend me when I can't do it for myself. So if you are neutral, you are, you know, comfortable with being non-racist. So you're okay with having black friends, but you're not gonna challenge other friends who may say very demeaning things about black people God. or brown people or any, t any person of color or any sexual orientation or any religious, religious background, right? A neutral person is like, well, not my problem. But it's all of our problem because we all share this world. We all share this earth, right? So it is your problem. Because if someone, if you were ever to come to an all black neighborhood and a black, and a black person tried to do something to you, you better believe that I would check them in a heartbeat, that I would get in front of you and I would be like, not my friend Abs right. or not him. You don't even have to be a friend, right? But, but we're not doing that, right? I'm just, in my mind, I want the same, like the same protection. I'm not going to be like, well, I didn't even see color. I have no idea why he would, you know, do that to you. No, saying I don't see color is, is one of the worst things that you can say right now. And I'm talking to black men and women left and right. They are crowding my DMs as well. And that is actually more hurtful than it's helpful. And I know people mean well, but that's not how it comes off. And right now, meaning well is not enough. No. No, we have to do more. You, you have to do more. And you have to do more outside of when someone is murdered senselessly in the street. Like this can't be something that dies down again next week. It can't die down a couple weeks from now. It needs to become a part of our regular conversation. Like people, before all this happened, week last week or week before last i have a, a predominantly well i have an all black um mastermind group women's mastermind group and one of my good friends has a mostly white mastermind group and we have been talking about this back and forth about bringing our communities together and really reminding these women that we're all the same we all have the same struggles doubts fears 
irritations with our significant other. We're all tired of homeschooling, right? Like we all have the same frustrations. There's no reason for us to choose to, to self-segregate because that's what happens. I have plenty of white women who follow me, but when I open up my programs, only black women sign up. And my girlfriend was saying that she has plenty of black women that follow her, but when she opens up a program, only white women show up. Hmm. And we were, we had been talking about that and comparing like, what do you think that is? So we brought these women together, about 30 of them and had this discussion. We brought them together and had a conversation. This is literally the Saturday before George Floyd died. Um, and we talked for two and a half, maybe three hours and just women shared their experiences. And there was the, so many of the white women were just saying like, but I, I never know what to say, or I had no idea this was a thing. You know, I had a black woman in my group whose son played football, the whole team in the small town they lived in wanted to wear pink bandanas for like breast cancer awareness month. And she made him take his off because she didn't want him to be mistaken for a gangbanger. And this guy is an all American track star, go headed to college, all these things, but no one, but people are not going to know that if he's the one with the band, even if they all have the same bandana, he would be the one to be pulled out of the group. And we know that as black parents. And that's, we, you know, that's a whole nother layer on top of it because my daughter loves everybody. You know, when you've met Reagan, Reagan is, good with everyone she like to have to explain to her what's going on is heartbreaking wow. it's heartbreaking because i don't want her to believe that white people are evil she knows that that's not true she knows who our friends are and it's hard it's hard. Mm. It's hard. When I was her age, the Rodney King riots were going on. Mm. In 1992, the Rodney King riots, I lived in South Central Los Angeles. I remember making signs for everyone in my building that said Black owned so that people wouldn't burn our building down. Mm. So when I see the buildings on fire, it just brings back all of these memories that I had being a fifth grade girl. And, and helping write these signs. And just think of the trauma of that. I'm, I'm in fifth grade. What 11 year old should be trying to save a building from being burned by standing outside with my, my own body holding a sign at that age? And I remember telling my mom when all that happened, I was like, I'm so glad when I grow up, racism is not gonna exist because I knew exactly what racism was in fifth grade. And I told my mom, I'm so glad when I grow up. And now I have a 12 year old daughter and I have to explain the same pictures 30 years later that she's seen, you know? Can you comment on um, the, the protesting versus the looting? And I had a conversation with uh, Tim Story about that this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, Tim Story said, you know, lo looting versus protesting. One is is of violence, you know, rioting, um, and we all know that that is not. And people watching that saying, "Oh, I would never participate in that." But like you're saying, but are you the person who would stand up? and be the the voice on the elevator when right a right. wrong has happened right i mean i think there's a couple things that go along with this first of all protests are peaceful right so many of the people that i know personally family friends uh neighbors acquaintances they have gone out to protest peacefully many things have started out peacefully until agitators come in and create these scenarios and you know go back and forth with police or do all these extra things and so a peaceful protest now turns into chaos which we've seen and that's a lot of what's been publicized on the news and put in media but there have been so many 
peaceful protests or, you know, gatherings that started out quite peacefully, right? Um, I think that in this particular instance, there are so many things that led up to the pent up frustration. Not only is it the death of unarmed black men and women over and over and over again, um, plus again, all the stories that we don't hear, that you don't see. And if I'm, if I'm a privileged woman who lives in a big house in the suburbs and I only go out to go speak, which you know when I haven't been speaking. So I've been indoors. Like I have the privilege of staying indoors. I had the luxury of choosing to self quarantine, right? And not being forced to be an essential worker, working for a couple dollars an hour, putting my life on the line, you know, doing all these very frustrating things, waiting for it. I, you know, I didn't have the, a, a stimulus check, right? Waiting on a $1,200 dollar stimulus checks like people are up to here already from COVID-19 then you add on just you know the not being able to work there's 40 million people unemployed in this country right now which means they got nothing but time right if you add to much of this possibly a lack of education no money coming in and just furious about what this is what is happening again it was like the perfect storm right it was the perfect storm there were just too many elements that lined up all at the same time to make it easy for people to like snap and justify this behavior and so i don't condone it but i understand it right i, you, I understand that can you give us advice on how to rise above um that behavior because again, the, the message that you're sending out and that many others are sending out can get lost because people are focused more on, on the rioting. Mm -hmm. And like you said, they're missing because the news is missing the, the peaceful yeah. demonstrators, the, the vigils. Well, I would say this, what comes, the first thing that comes to mind, and I hope it answers the question. I think that back to the silence piece, you cannot all of a sudden speak up and tell people to be peaceful and stop rioting and stop burning buildings because what you're asking them to do in many instances is care more about a building than black a black life that is lost over and over and over again right um and you know again i think a lot of i think a lot of what's happening out there are people are you know being agitated to do those things like a lot of people who are going to protest are not that way like it's not it's not that i feel like the people who are doing all this extra stuff throwing rocks through windows and looting and like i don't know that I, i'm gonna say that this goes back to like lack of education and lack of opportunity and that there is a lot of financial disparity that will cause people to do that. I don't know many people personally that would participate in, in something like that, right? But much of this country is suffering already financially. So when you create the perfect storm and there's an opportunity to feel justified in some type of action, this is what people are going to go do. I would never loot and riot, but, you know, I mean, I also don't have to. And if I were in that position and from that place, I can't say what I would do. I've just, I've never been in those shoes. So it's unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate, but I, I think I think one of the challenges even for African-American people right now is that when people reference rioting and looting, they lean into acting like it's black people. And I've seen story after story where people have taken video and taken pictures and it's very much an everybody thing, but black people will be blamed. Right. And then black people will be called thugs. And then black people will become Again, you know, I've seen the comments where people are like, well, this is why you're stereo, why black people are stereotyped this way. Okay, 
Um, but when there's a sports event and, you know, a, a white team wins and they trash it downtown, it's right, right. expected and it's celebration and it's all these other things. Like, it, it, like the, the double standard is so annoying. <laughs> and I think, I think the, message, the message is uh, don't let that divert where your attention needs to go. Right. Because it's, 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 it's unnecessary. Not that it's unnecessary. In this conversation, it's unnecessary chatter. And it's drawing the attention away from where we need to be focused on. And where we yeah. need to be focused on is this message that you're delivering. Yeah, I mean, it's those conversations are not productive. It just goes back to when the conversations are about um, systemic racism and and all of the laws and all of the things that are put in place to oppress a whole um, segment of the population, and you keep making it about buildings or loot like people who okay. feel that they have ownership in their in their community don't burn down their community. Right. But they have to have ownership of it. They have right. to know that this is theirs. They have to know that I'm safe here. If you don't even feel safe there by the people who are supposed to protect and serve, why would you care? Right. It's, you know, it's, a, it's again, I don't condone it, but I understand. Got it. You know, I, I know I take a risk in even having this conversation with you. I know t I take a risk um, that, that I'm going to be blasted a little bit, but that's the risk. We have to have the courage. Mm -hmm. uh, courage means that we have the fear and there's a lot of fear on this planet right now. Courage means we have the fear, but we walk through it anyway. We still continue to move forward. Yeah. And I, I want to ask questions. I want to be smart enough to just shut up and listen. I just need to listen right now. Well, I, I took, you know, people were sending me messages saying, what about your brand partners? You know? What about your brand? A lot of the money that I make every year is because brands like large financial institutions align with me. You know, could could they consider me to be a little risky right now? I don't know. But I also don't care. You know, right. I also know that um, I have dear friends who I believe heard that message and they were moved by it. And I know that they like you are, are going to do the work mm -hmm. to educate their families, their, you know, their sphere of influence to have maybe some different conversations to make sure, um, you know, their platforms are diverse and all of these things that I know are going to happen. And then I have others that wanted to tell me that all cops weren't bad. Right. What did that have to do with what I said and how I shared my experience? What does that have to do with anything? All cops are not bad, just like all black people are not looters. Right. I don't have, we don't have to say these generalizations, right? So, you know, I took a risk too. We all take a risk every time we take a stand, but I would rather stand for something than fall for everything that people throw my way. And I would rather know that I used my voice and I used my platform to to inspire some type of change to plant seeds of change if it were just 10 people win i would be fine if it were 10 people who said i'm going to have more conversations about this with my friends and family and my children then i would have done my part the beautiful well, thing is it's been over a hundred thousand views or something and no i looked it up it was one hundred and thirty thousand views of that video the last time that i looked and that's certainly going to grow as, as it should. Um, what, what advice do you have specifically to our Palm Mitchell schools? Because our schools are diverse. One of our belief systems is one size fits all. We want to be a place where we don't care about your age, your size, your sexual orientation, your religious or political affiliation. Again, we want to create a culture where everybody is safe, where everybody belongs. Do we get it right every single time? Not even close. But that's our intention and that's the direction that we're going to move move in and we need to get smarter and stronger about it as we continue moving in that direction and this is an opportunity this is a all experiences come with the lesson i want to learn the lesson i don't want to have to repeat this experience over and over again you know till life right. forces me to learn the lesson i want to surrender and learn the lesson so whew. yeah 
what advice do you have? Because our schools are diverse. And as our schools are going back in session, so they're physically able to come back to the building together. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're facing each other. They're, they're looking across the table from each other. You look different than I do. You have a different skin color. You have a different lifestyle than I do. Um, what's, what's the lesson? What's, maybe not what's the lesson. What's, what's your advice? How do we work yeah. through that? Well, so a few things come to mind immediately. One of the first things that come to mind is to address the elephant in the room up front. I don't think that it's productive or safe to just jump back into school without acknowledging that there have been all of these things happening and that people may need maybe grieving. And while they have to go and do what they have to do, that there's still something um, you know, that comes up for them and they need a safe space to be able to communicate that. So I think up front, knowing that they're safe will be really important um, if they're still struggling with any of the things that they've experienced over the last, over the last week or in the last couple months. Um, I think that if there's not some type of like, the, like there needs to be something where people can just be okay with affirming their reality. And what I mean by that is if someone, especially if you're a person of color or, or there's something, you know, there's something that makes you maybe not the norm, not the majority, whatever that is, that if someone says something that you believe to be insensitive, it's important that you don't just swallow that because that's the thing that eats away at us. And when, you know, I talk about in Redefining Wealth, the fit pillar, how a lot of times it's not that we're not equipped or um, educated enough to go after things, but it's all the conversations that we've had in the back of our heads. And it's all the stuff that people have said to us, you know, over time that really chips away at our confidence and, and us feeling like we're worthy enough to go after things. But that happens when there's even small conversations that get had and they're not checked. And not that you have to check them like aggressively, but if someone says something that's offensive, you should be okay with saying, what did you mean by that? Because a lot of times the person being offensive doesn't realize they're being offensive. That's normal where they're from. That might be normal language in their household. That might be just the way things are. And so if you can get someone to see that that's not just the way it is in a loving way, right? There's a reason that I didn't go ape shit on that video, right? <laughs> There's a reason that I didn't. My daughter said, we watched someone else's video and the woman was just cursing and carrying on. And she was very effective, but she, you know, she took her own way of doing it. One, that's not my normal demeanor, right, to, to do that anyway. But two, I realized that I could move more people with love and just sharing my truth than trying to pound something into people or yell or curse them out. And so what I'm saying is if someone does or says something that really does feel like, wait a minute, I don't know how I feel about that as, as a Black woman, as a LGBTQ, you know, I don't, like whatever, I should say something and not from a place of defensiveness, from let me give them possibly the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they don't know that that's what that sounds like. Like, I don't know how that can be done in the school setting. I'm not trying to start like, <laughs> like any, you know, beefing at school, but it's important that we don't let these things go unchecked because now if you don't feel safe, you cut yourself off from someone and they don't have the opportunity to learn how beautiful you actually are and like really experience a genuine connection and relationship with you because they made a comment and then you just decided they're off limits to me, that's it. Well, one of our, our goals in the Palmetto School culture is that we, we want people to feel safe, we want them to feel that they belong, and we want them to feel that they have a purpose, that they're making a difference. Uh, what a better time than now for us to really look at that because that's not just a beautiful poster that we put on the wall. Now is the opportunity that we all have to walk into a room and you walk into a room like this, what are you gonna attract? You're gonna attract a fight. 
-hmm. rather than can I walk into this room and, and educate people? Can I walk into this room and be a student? Can I humble myself? I think you said it, affirming people's realities. You know, in, in your video, when you talked about, I mean, you're um, a beautiful black woman. Uh, I'm sure you drive a nice car. And yet when you see a policeman following you, there's anxiety there. I've never experienced that. I don't know what you've, that, that hasn't happened to me. I haven't had that anxiety. You know what's um, quite interesting about that point? I got pulled over about a year ago before we left LA, driving Reagan to school. And what really bothered me was Reagan was in knots. Now, why? Why is she in knots? She was in knots like, I mean- like she had the anxiety. She had the anxiety. And I was like, oh. you know, it, that broke my heart because this is passed on generation after generation. Right. right like this is this is passed on it's almost like it's in our dna this is this is generations of trauma and generations of feeling certain ways where even you know if you don't quote unquote live in the hood right if you don't have some of these same experiences oh i've, I've never committed a crime i've never done anything that would make you feel like, well, why would she be scared of the police? Because I've seen it enough times. Yeah. I've looked through my window and seen Black people being batoned in my neighborhood growing up. Like, I've seen it too many times. So, yes, there is a fear that comes up. And my daughter, who's never lived in any circumstance like I have, ex has experienced it. And she's never been through any of the same stuff. Her, her upbringing has been completely different than mine, yet she carries this anxiety in her at 12 years old. That ought not be. And I, I need to understand that, and so does everybody watching this. You know, we need to seek to understand and then to be understood as we learn from other mentors. Um, Patrice, I don't wanna keep you much longer. I know you have so much on your plate. I, I just cannot thank you enough for your time here today. Um, I, I invite this conversation to continue. But as all of you have witnessed, the conversation that Patrice and I are having is we're not attacking each other. <laughs> we're not against each other. We're not listening uh, or we're not, we're not speaking without listening first. It's, it's, we're trying to model what this conversation needs to look like and what it needs to be about. And I think the advice that you gave Patrice was, was perfect. Uh, there, there needs to be good conversations. As we all go back to schools, as we are allowed back into our buildings, as more and more states start to open up, of course, this is gonna be addressed. It needs to be addressed. And, and we all need to feel safe in doing that. Can I say um, one more thing, Wynn, before we um, head out? Absolutely. I just wanna remind, any and everyone here too, um, I'm assuming everyone here is over the age of 18 years old. Um, it is so critical that you vote. That is a tangible, practical thing that you can do because, you know, police commissioners are appointed by mayors, right? You know, there, there's like such a widespread issue here. And if we don't, register to vote and then actually participate in voting, not every four years for the presidential election, but even in your local, um, you know, your local elections, this is so imperative because we can talk over and over and over again, but at the end of the day, if the people in power don't have always the best intention for everybody in the community, these right. types of things keep happening over and over and over again. And unfortunately, when it's time to vote, you know, we check out. Young people check out, a lot of people of color check out. And I really want to encourage you not to check out this year or another election in your life. Like voting matters. We have to show up and we have to educate ourselves and not, not on party lines, not on, well, my parents are this, or I think I'm that, like, follow these people, look at what they're talking about in their social platforms now, look at their track record, don't be too busy, because if you're too busy, 
you know, when you have an opportunity to be proactive, you're going to waste a lot of time having to be reactive and it can cost you time and money and everything else like we're seeing now. So make a commitment that you'll be proactive, not just for yourself, but on behalf of people that look like me. You know, I get one vote. I see Jordan McCook is here. He gets one vote, right? But we need additional votes to just help this thing along. So we, I'd rather you vote. That's staying silent when it's time to vote is another way that you stand on the side of the oppressor because they're depending on you not to vote. I'm glad Jordan is on. He and I had a conversation a couple of days ago, which I was very, very grateful for. <laughs> Again, I, I want to be uh, part of the solution. I really want to listen. I really want to take a step back and I don't need to have, I'm paid to have answers, right? People pay me to hear what I have to say. I don't really want to have to say something right now. Yeah. I, I, I want to be able to, uh, to take the advice and, and take the, the experiences and learn the lesson. And if I can do that through the filters of my beautiful friends, such as you, Patrice, that just means the world to me. I appreciate you, Lynn. Mm. I, I really do. Do you have a final message for everybody? watching, listening right now? My final message is just to use your voice. Use your voice to stand up for justice. You don't have to know every word to say. You don't have to have perfect words. You don't have to be the most eloquent man or woman. You don't have to be a platform speaker. You just have to be someone with a heart that cares about mm -hmm. everyone, not just people that look like you. And use your voice and uh, never stop using mm -hmm. your voice. What a great message. I have a feeling that if you were attracted to sign up for a Paul Mitchell school, there was something about our culture that wasn't the pretty model that attracted you to Paul Mitchell's schools. It was our culture that attracted you. And because you signed up with the Paul Mitchell school, you are now part of that family. You're now part of that brand. And that brand stands for so much more than uh, a pretty model, a wonderful shampoo, a brilliant haircut it stands for so much more than that and now is the time where we can really we can really shine you guys this is our chance this is our opportunity we want people to feel safe we want people to feel that they belong and we want people to feel that they make a difference so i love you patrice i love you too tell gerald i said hi <laughs> Tell George I said the same. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys.